Um, thank you to all the wonderful devotees who are assembled. My apologies. I was um, I was taking a little bit of a break to just reconvene with my my own sadhana and bhajan. Um, so I'm happy to be back and sharing uh, any small thing that I can that's in line with parampara like this. So we are reading <clears throat> chapter 14 of the 10th canto, and we are reading verses 54 to 55. So I will read the verses and the translation. Let's see, 54 to 55. Okay. <clears throat> the verses say, Tasmat priyatama swatama sarvesham apidehinam tadartameva sakalam jagat etach characharam. Translation Therefore, it is his own self that is most dear to every embodied living being. And it is simply for the satisfaction of this self that the whole material creation of moving and non-moving entities exists. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Srila Prabhupada. The word chara charam indicates moving living entities such as animals and non-moving living entities such as trees. Or the word may also refer to moving possessions, such as one's family and pets, and non-moving possessions, such as one's house and household paraphernalia. Text 55. Krishnam enam avehitvam, atmanam akilatmanam, jagaditaya sopyatra, dehiva bhati mayaya. Translation, you should know Krishna to be the original soul of all living entities. For the benefit of the whole universe, he has, out of his causeless mercy, appeared as an ordinary human being. He has done this by the strength of his internal potency. The purport. In the Chaitanya Charitamrit, Madhya Lila, chapter 20, text 162. Srila Prabhupada comments on this verse as follows. Parikshit Maharaj asked Shukadev Goswami why Krishna was so beloved by the residents of Vrindavan, who loved him even more than their own offspring or life itself. At that time, Shukadev Goswami replied that everyone's atma or soul is very, very dear, especially to all living entities who have accepted material bodies. However, that Atma, the spirit soul, is part and parcel of Krishna. For this reason, Krishna is very dear to every living entity. Everyone's body is very dear to oneself, and one wants to protect the body by all means, because within the body, the soul is living. Due to the intimate relationship between the soul and the body, the body is important and dear to everyone. Similarly, the soul being part and parcel of Krishna, the Supreme Lord, is very, very dear to all living entities. Unfortunately, the soul forgets his constitutional position and thinks he is only the body, Dehatma Buddhi. Thus, the soul is subjected to the rules and regulations of material nature. When a living entity by his intelligence reawakens his attraction for Krishna, he can understand that he is not the body, but part and parcel of Krishna. Thus, filled with knowledge, he no longer labors under attachment to the body and everything related to the body. Janasya mohoyam aham mameti. Material existence wherein one thinks I am the body and this belongs to me is also illusory. One must redirect his attraction to Krishna. Srimad Bhagavatam 127 states Vasudeva Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojita Janyata Asuvaira Gyam Gyanam Chayad Ahaitukam. By rendering devotional service unto the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, one immediately acquires causeless knowledge and detachment from the world. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. 
ओम ज्ञान ज्ञानांजना शलाकया चाक्षुर ओं मिलिता यना थस्म श्री गुरव नम श्री चैतन्य मनोबीष्टा स्थापित यन भूतले स्वयां रूपा खदा ददाति स्वापदाखा नम ओं विष्णुपदाय कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमाथे भक्ति वेदात स्वामी नमिने नमस्ते सरस्वती देव गौरवाणी प्रचालिने निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देश तारिने जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधर श्रीवासादि गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे जय ओके सो आई विल रीड दिस जस्ट द ट्रांसलेशंस ऑफ द वर्सेस एंड वी विल स्टार्ट टू गेट इनटू इट सो द ट्रांसलेशंस ऑफ दिस वर्सेस वंस अगेन से देयरफॉर it is his own self that is most dear to every embodied living being and it is simply for the satisfaction of this self that the whole material creation of moving and non-moving entities exists you should know krishna to be the original soul of all living entities for the benefit of the whole universe he has out of his causeless mercy appeared as an ordinary human being he has done this by the strength of his internal potency Okay. I really really like this um passage here. And just to put it into context, all of you are much more um disciplined I'm sure than me and coming to Bhagavatam every morning, so you all know the context, but just to remind us, this is Maharaj Parikshit asking Shukadev Goswami this question of why the gopis developed more love than their own offspring. uh more love for krishna right because during this brahma vimohan leela krishna um expanded himself to take the form of all the cowherd boys and all of the calves and the mothers the gopis they they develop more love for this expansion of krishna in the form of their children than of their children themselves so maharaj parikshit was a little bit confused about this and he wanted some clarification and so he asked shukadev goswami And Shukadev Goswami has been giving this answer in a couple of verses now before this but essentially the main teaching here is that the most important um thing the most important thing to ourselves is our self is the self the atman right our own self and it's really interesting because um hmm not see it's really interesting because there is there's a lot of there's you know the two extremes are selflessness and selfishness right i am selfish i act only on my for my own interest or for my own regard or i am selfless i act without any interest of myself and only for the regard of others and it's two interesting extremes we'll get into it for sure but i just wanted to first start off with um a story um that i always thought was very fun when i was when i was studying this passage um when i used to live in the bhakti center and our dear jay jagannath he he very much taught um us when we were living there and he told us this story and it's like kind of like impregnated in my mind of 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 how this concept of the self being the most important thing to ourselves and he would always say the self just as an orange is orangish the self is selfish And so he would tell the story which i think is very nice he said that he was living in the ashram in chicago and um one day there was a robbery one day apparently some person got into the ashram somehow and stole someone's laptop someone's computer and so the prabhu who had kind of um uh, found out was going through the halls and kind of like you know like telling everyone like oh my god there's been a robbery there's been a robbery like this like this like this and uh, people were starting to to check all their things and realize and as such and then one prabhu in particular um he realized he had gone through all of his things and he had realized like that his laptop had been stolen and once he realized that his laptop had been stolen he was you know livid just like completely like really really upset <laughs> that his laptop had been stolen 
And he was complaining to the other Prabhus. He was telling them, he was just like, I can't believe this. I can't believe this has happened. My laptop has been installed. All my information was on there like this. And in particular, he was telling one of the other Prabhus, one, one of his other friends. Yeah, laptops are expensive. I just had to get a new one. They're expensive. He was telling one of his other friends, he was like, can you believe this? This this robber got in and he stole my laptop and like this and et cetera and whatever, all of my things. And it's so expensive, you know, all the stories. And the Prabhu who was listening, his friend was just listening like, yeah, I'm sorry, Prabhu, that really, you know, that's what to do, you know, like that's, that's really, that's really sad. <laughs> that's really bad. I'm so sorry for you like this. You know, he was kind of like this. And then the Prabhu tells him, oh, I forgot to tell you, your laptop has also been stolen. And then the Prabhu goes, what? Why didn't you tell me this at the beginning? I can't believe you didn't tell me this. And like, ah, and he just got so upset at the Prabhu. He got upset at the situation. He was just very, very angry. And so the point of the story being that when one of the devotees didn't know that his laptop had also been stolen, you know, the, the feeling was like, oh, yeah, I feel so bad for you, you know like this, there was a little bit of, um, we're going to get into this idea of compassion. I like this word. Um, there was a little bit of compassion. Oh yeah, I'm so sorry. You know, too bad. When he realized that it was also his laptop that had been stolen, then it was, you know, a drama. Then it was like, I can't believe he didn't tell me. Oh my God. Now it's about me, right? Now it's about me. Hmm. So the self is inherently uh, according to here in this passage, it's 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 most important part is its self, the things that are that we associate with ourself, right? And we see this in our natural kind of not natural. We see this in our societal kind of situation right now, where we have a lot of, and I won't get into this too much, but you know, people have a lot of opinions about a lot of things, um, and they'll say, "Oh, I feel for this or this situation going on in the world, or this happening over there, or this happening here." But it's not necessarily directly involved with us. It's not happening at our doorstep, and it's not happening to us. So therefore, there's almost this what's the word distance, right? That I can have. Oh, I'm so sorry that your laptop was also lost. I I have so much, you know, compassion in my heart for this. And it's really interesting. I'd like to, before we really get into the verses and what is being told here, um, when I was reading this, I immediately thought of the beginning of Bhagavad Gita. And I immediately thought of Arjuna and uh, his his compassion, right? Actually, this word is used, kripaya, kripya, right? The, this compassion that Arjuna has. And it's used in the context of Arjuna not wanting to fight, we also have to remember the context that before Arjuna did his whole about face on the battlefield, he had a very different like mood, right? I believe the correct Sanskrit word that was used is durdube, which means like he told Krishna, like, take me to the middle of the battlefield to see the evil minded people, durdube, right? Let me see them all, right? So he had this kind of like this kind of attitude of just like, yes, they're evil. I've already decided like this. And they were actually evil. <laughs> like they, they did a lot of evil things to Arjuna and his family. So when Arjuna had this about face, we won't get into this too much. As we all know, he gave various, various, various arguments to Krishna of why he would not fight, right? The progeny and society and society crumbling and crippling because of his decision and, you know, all of these different, different arguments that Arjuna gave to Krishna um, as to why he would not fight. And um, actually, uh, this is stated here in Bhagavad Gita. This is the first verse of the second chapter where Krishna uh, or Sanjaya is saying that Arjuna, full of compassion, mm, this is where the word is used, his mind depressed, his eyes full of tears, um, and then Krishna spoke the following words. And in the purport, I'd like to read the purport because I think it's really important to what we are speaking here. So this is Srila Prabhupada. He says, material compassion. Mm, so this is very interesting. Very clear difference between material compassion and spiritual compassion. So Prabhupada says, material compassion, lamentation, and tears 
are all signs of ignorance of the real self. Compassion for the eternal soul is self-realization. Hmm. I'll read that again. It says, material compassion, lamentation, and tears are all signs of ignorance of the real self. Compassion for the eternal soul is self-realization. Hmm. And I'll keep reading just a little bit because it's very fascinating. Prabhupada says, the word Madhusudana is significant in this verse. Lord Krishna killed the demon Madhu, and now Arjuna wanted Krishna to kill the demon of misunderstanding that had overtaken him in the discharge of his duty. No one knows where compassion should be applied. Compassion for the dress of a drowning man is senseless. A man fallen in the ocean of nescience cannot be saved simply by rescuing his outward dress, the gross material body. One who does not know this and laments for the outward dress is called a shudra, or one who laments unnecessarily. Arjuna was a kshatriya and this conduct was not expected from him. Lord Krishna, however, can dissipate the lamentation of the ignorant man, and for this purpose, the Bhagavad Gita was sung by him. And therefore, we remember that actually when Krishna starts speaking to Arjuna and his first instruction to him, does anyone know? I want to make this maybe a little interactive. Does anyone know that first verse, the first instruction, what does Krishna say to Arjuna? Yes, Ashochanan Vashochastvam, Pragya Vadams Chabashashe, Gata Sunagadasumscha, Nanu Shochan Tipanditaha. That you are lamenting that which is not worthy of lamentation, and the wise lament neither for the living nor the dead, like this. Yes. So this is really interesting because I think, um, yeah, I really like Andrea's comment actually. She says, that sounds harsh. That's my trigger response. And it's like, it is a little harsh. Like sometimes you read these things and it's harsh. But I also think that we have to go back to the principle. And the principle of what Srila Prabhupada is saying is, and I'm getting to this slowly, is that we need superior guidance. We need superior guidance. That us, by our own kind of material conditioning, trying to apply these spiritual principles where we want them willy-nilly um, can get us into trouble, right? And I really, really like um, Srila Prabhupada's kind of um, his purport where he's saying here, like when we're trying to save the outward material dress of people, uh, of a person, um, we're kind of misstepping or foregoing the, the soul, right? We're just trying to save the outward dress. And I could get into a whole conversation about that. Um, you know, I was a social worker for some time and I have a lot of lived experience in that, but I will maybe save that for the end because I really want to make my, my philosophical points before I get there. So let's see. Okay. So now we have determined or we have put this here, um, this idea of compassion, right? Because, and the reason I wanted to focus on this compassion, material compassion versus spiritual compassion is because when we think of the self, right now we're talking about the self, myself, me, um, it can get really interesting in terms of, and by interesting, I mean complicated. It can get kind of complicated in terms of like, how do I maneuver this selflessness versus selfishness? How do I maneuver putting everything on the line, giving my all like this versus actually, wait a minute, I need to have boundaries and focus on myself a little bit and do what's better for me. How do I maneuver? I'm giving and I'm giving and I'm giving and I'm doing and I'm doing and I'm doing versus actually I need to stay home and take a bath, you know, like this, right? And this is a very practical thing because we see a lot of devotees who get burnt out, a lot of people in general who get burnt out because they're giving and they're giving and they're doing and they're doing, whether they're, whether they're helping the outward dress, you know, like I remember when I was a social worker, I got burnt out, whether we're devotees who are doing devotional service, right, there is an element of burnout that happens as well. And so, yeah, this interesting spectrum of selflessness versus selfishness, it's really interesting. But back to the verses. So let's see. Shukadev Goswami is asking this question. Oh, sorry. Uh, Maharaj Parikshit is asking this question to 
Shukadeva Goswami, about how is it that the gopis fell in love and were just in, in so much uh, more so than their own children. They had such deep, intense love. Hmm? And how is that possible? So Shukadeva Goswami gives the answer um, that Krishna is the original Atman, the original person, right? That he is the soul of all souls. Govindam Adi Purusham, right? We sing this every morning. And therefore, um, it makes sense, right? And I think I think we can capture that quite clearly, right? It makes sense why the gopis were developing more love um, for Krishna expansion into their children than their children themselves, because Krishna is the we are part and parcel of Krishna. Our souls are part and parcel of Krishna. And Krishna is the ultimate supreme soul. So in the purport of the actual verse, Srila Prabhupada gives us this really simple, bhakti is really simple and also complicated. Well, I think we tend to complicate it. But Srila Prabhupada gives this really simple um, direction in, in his purport where he says, uh, let's see, I had it and then I lost it. He says that, oh, I found it. He says that we have to redirect our attraction to Krishna, right? That we have to redirect our attraction to Krishna. So our attraction tends to be directed towards all the things that aren't Krishna. Okay, so this is a little bit, I want to really break this down because this is a little, it can get a little bit heady. So the self is the most important thing to ourself, according to these verses, according to Shukadeva Goswami. However, Shri Prabhupada is telling us that, that us in this embodied situation tend to mistake the self for the body. Yes. So we tend to mistake the self for the body. And then as such, we think the body is the most important thing to ourself. The body incorporating the mind, the emotions, all the things with the body. And therefore, as such, all things that that make the body happy, right? So sense enjoyment like this, the things attached to the body, the people attached to the body in our mind and our stories, etc., will make us quote unquote happy. And so the process then of Krishna consciousness is quite simple, right? Right now, um, our attraction is to the body and the things that are going to make the body uh, have some sort of enjoyment. However, as we know, as we perhaps logically know, Cheto Darpana Marjanam, right? That this, this kirtan, these practices of bhakti yoga are there to kind of wipe the mirror of the heart clean. They're there to uncover, right? This thing, uh, this, this soul inside of us that is part and parcel of Krishna. And so this redirection of our attraction towards Krishna is the method, right? It's the method of, of bhakti. However, I, I like to give this point a lot and I wasn't gonna necessarily go here today, but I guess maybe it will tie things together. The idea of redirecting our attraction to Krishna sounds simple, but it's also not. <laughs> Because me left to my own material nonsense, I can say, I think the easiest example is, here is my phone, and I will redirect all of my phone usage time <laughs> to Krishna. <laughs> and we all know, you know, or I'll speak for myself, I know that when my phone tells me at the end of the day, you've been on your phone for six hours today five hours today how many of those hours was i using it in krishna service you know that can be a rhetorical question for now so um it's not so easy right redirection redirecting our attraction to krishna is is not so easy because we are conditioned right we're in these conditioned bodies um and this is Bhagavad Gita chapter 9, verse 29, I'm pretty sure. And in the purport, Srila Prabhupada, this is the point that I like to bring up a lot. Srila Prabhupada speaks about yukta vairagya. So yukta vairagya, uh, many of us know this term. It means um, dovetailing um, material paraphernalia, dovetailing things in this material world in Krishna's, um, uh, in the service of Krishna right? In the service of Krishna. So technically, 
technically, because Krishna is um, imminent in the material world, right? Very different than kind of a Judeo-Christian understanding philosophically. Krishna is imminent in the material world, right? These beautiful passages in Bhagavad Gita where Krishna says, um, uh, I am the taste of water. I am the, the, the strength in man, right? Like this, all these things. So Krishna is imminent and therefore we can actually spiritualize or Krishnify all things and offer it back to Krishna, which is such a beautiful aspect of bhakti, right? However, so this is the this is the term yukta vairagya. I can spiritualize anything in this material world and offer it back to Krishna. Hmm? However, this is very slippery territory because I can then that well if I'm saying that then that means I can Krishnify my uh, my phone and I can Krishnify my Mercedes Benz and I can Krishnify my you know I don't know I can Krishnify anything I want right and technically that is correct. But in this purport, uh, chapter 9, verse 29, I'm actually going to pull it up so that I can make sure that I'm correct about this. And so I can make sure that I'm reading uh, from it and not just speculating. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> can you Krishnify me? I can't Krishnify you. Ooh, I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong. It's um, verse 28. Yeah, it was verse 28. So Srila Prabhupada in the purport, I love this. He's talking about Yukta Vairagya. And he says, one who acts in Krishna consciousness under superior direction is called Yukta. The technical term is Yukta Vairagya. Hmm. And then he says that it's further explained by Rupa Goswami. He speaks about, he speaks the specific verse in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. But then a little bit more, he says, Rupa Goswami says that as long as we are in this material world, we have to act, right? Krishna says this too at the beginning of chapter 3 Bhagavad Gita, that we are all forced to act helplessly. Hmm? Uh, we cannot cease acting, back to the purport. And then it says, therefore, if actions are performed and the fruits are given to Krishna, then this is called Yukta Vairagya. Yes. So we are not attached to the results of the outcome. However, the main point that I'm trying to make here is that it must be, Srila Prabhupada is saying, under superior direction. Yes, under superior direction. So here, what is being spoken about um, where Srila Prabhupada in these verses in Srimad Bhagavatam is telling us that um, we have to redirect our attention to Krishna, we need to do it under the prescribed methods. Yeah, by our acharyas. And I'll end here. I wanted to leave more time for conversation today. The main point that I'm trying to make, I suppose, is that there is a science of bhakti that is laid out for us by our acharyas. The nine processes of devotional service, the five angas of bhakti, right? There's progress to be made, the nine stages of bhakti. There's so many lists in bhakti, which I like. I like a good list. The 64 angas of bhakti, like this, yeah? So there's all these processes, These there's all these steps, right? And there's a science, it's laid out for us. And so I guess my, my point is that it can be a little bit, um, it can be a little bit dangerous, I'm going to use that word, to decide for myself um, what redirecting my life or my consciousness towards Krishna means or looks like, right? And I need to actually look for that superior direction in guru, in shastra, in sadhu sangha, in community, right? When I'm acting solely by myself without any other um, kind of like checks and balances system, then I can... Um, wander into the terrain of selfishness i can wander into the terrain of material compassion as arjuna was right where it's like i just want to do all this good stuff for everyone i'll end with this and then i'll open it up i remember when i was a social worker i was a social worker for many years my boss she was so cool my boss told us um and she trained us that one of the main red flags to look out for when we were hiring new people 
the main red flag to look out for when hiring new people was when people were just really speaking a lot about how they want to help the world and they just it just makes them feel so good and they want to help everyone and they they're just so sad about everything and they just want to help and help and help and help and help and this was the main red flag to look out for can anyone guess why why that would be a red flag the first to burn out yeah yeah it refers to burnout it, it, it really leads to burnout because there's nothing deeper guiding that, right? So going back to what we're talking about here, um, my boss would say there's nothing deeper guiding that, right? It's not, it's not, it's not, in her terms, it wasn't ideological. It was more a personal kind of um, vendetta of compassion. But here in this way that we're understanding philosophically, um, it's indicative of that material compassion, right? Where I just, I just want to, I just want to do it because it's going to make me feel better it's going to make this like this, et cetera. It's not guided by a superior direction. It's not, it's not actually linking us back to Krishna, right? It's actually keeping us um, in this state. And we must remember that at the end of Arjuna's arguments um, as to why he shouldn't fight, um, Krishna kind of let him have the sauce, right? He let him, he really let him have the sauce. He was just like, no, 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 no. And he smiled. Does everyone remember that? He kind of smiled right before he was about to, to share um, what he needed to share to Arjuna. He was like, okay, let's, let's, let's put your head back on straight here. And let's talk about, you know, uh, Jiva Tattva and, and, and the, 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 the understanding of the material world. And he really wanted Arjuna to, to understand this. So I'll end with the fact that here we're speaking about once again, in this 10th canto, this end of Brahma Vimohan Lila, Shukadev Goswami giving these wonderful answers about, about Krishna being the highest, the highest self, right? The soul of all souls, that original person. And therefore, bhakti is so beautiful and so simple because our compassion is valid. Our love is valid, but it has to be connected to Krishna right? Because if it's not connected to Krishna, and if I'm not offering that to Krishna under superior direction, then it runs the risk of going into material love or lust. And it runs the risk of going into material compassion. And it's, 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 a, very, it's a very clear demarcation. And Srila Prabhupada was very aware of it. And so, yeah, when I read this, I just felt like I wanted to, to share from, from that point. So I will end there um, and I will open to any comments or questions. Thank you, Kishore Chandra Prabhu. Andrea? Uh, I actually have a question. You mentioned uh, material compassion versus spiritual compassion and, and that was a big theme. And I was wondering, like, is there a middle ground? And I always thought that initiatives like Food for Life was a middle ground. A middle like an example of the middle ground so then my question is then why are there so many devotees who seem to be very upset about initiatives like food for life or other things of that sort i'm always very confused about that and i, I hope you can enlighten me mm. yeah i i don't know if i have like a philosophical answer for that but i definitely have a a kind of like practical lived experience answer of that i remember recently i was at govardhan eco village and, um, you know, Radhanath Swami has gotten a lot of criticisms um, for doing things, doing initiatives uh, for social welfare, right? Because sometimes um, you'll find people, devotees on, on extremes, of course, devotees are people too, right? And we end up in extremes of like, no, you're doing it wrong, or no, you're doing it wrong, and no, you're doing it wrong. And so Ranath Swami had received many criticisms for focusing on social welfare and, um, you know, Bhaktivedanta Hospital and GV itself and et cetera. And so I was at Govardhan Eco Village and we were there with some of the brahmacharis that were like, I think it was six, six brahmacharis that went from the Chaupati congregation um, to kind of start this project in the middle of nowhere. Right. And what, one of the brahmacharis told us was that it was really Maharaja's um, understanding and instruction that first um, we have to kind of 
help the surrounding area. We have to help the people here. We have to give them some sort of material boon. And then they will come to Krishna. Yeah. And then they will see uh, that they're offering something actually even deeper than that. And so they had this in mind. And of course, it's I wouldn't say it's necessarily an ulterior motive, because either way, they would be having Sadhu Sangha, either way, they would be having, you know, Prashad, which is wonderful. I think that is the middle ground. But if you go to Govardhan Eco Village now, it's like this, it's it's pretty amazing. It's it's really like a stunning project, not not necessarily because of all of the, the things that they've built and accomplished. But when you go to the villages and you go and you see the villagers, their hearts have been transformed. So yes, they were given, you know, they were given tools to, to, to farm and this and et cetera and whatever and technology and initiatives and all this stuff. But really their hearts have been transformed. And they're there so sweet, so in love with, with Krishna and Bhakti. And just like, it's really, really wonderful to watch. So I do believe personally, I do believe there is a middle ground. I don't think it's, I don't think that it's extremes either. We're just over here and we're, you know, all that social welfare is nonsense or we're just over here. And how could you, you know, you're forgetting about your common man. Um, actually these, this can get quite argumentative and it misses the point. And so I do believe there's a middle ground. And I think that middle ground, Trill Prabhupada, is saying it quite clearly here that the the principle should be that it is it is bringing people back to krishna yeah it is bringing people back to krishna so if it is done with that in mind and with that in the hearts of the devotees who are doing the project or doing the initiative then there's there's no there's no failure because either way whether whether that person who is being preached to or helped or in the hospital, whatever, taking the prashad, whether they come and become a devotee or or whether they just take prashadam and leave, that's okay. They're receiving so much benefit, right? I think we start to get into like um, hazy territory when um, when there's this like intense mood of proselytizing, right? Of like, you have to become a devotee right now. And if they don't, then that means you failed somehow. Um, so I don't, I, I think that there's extreme benefit. Um, and, you know, it's said in Bhagavad Gita that, that there's no, there's no failure in this endeavor, right? Whatever we do in this path, it is, it goes with us wherever we go after this. And so, yeah, I think there's a middle ground. And I think Srila Prabhupada gives the answer that it has to be returning us to connecting us to Krishna and that it has to be done under superior direction with blessings from our, from our teachers like this. So I hope that Kishore Chandra Prabhu, we're nominating you for a local GBC. <laughs> no, you just you just navigate in very difficult subject matters with, with ease. No, 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 no. I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want it to burn out. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think if I go to GBC, it'll be like immediate burnout. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll send William. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, uh, who's next? Krishnadaya Prabhu. Thank you, Kishor Chandra Prabhu, for wonderful deep realizations. Uh, there are two things. Like for the first thing, I would like to know uh, what your boss, what what was her thought process, what she was exactly looking for. You know, people with so much passion to help. And so, of course, that's not what she was looking for. But uh, what she was looking for, it would be interesting to know. What who was looking for? Uh, your boss for the oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> um, so basically her point was that her point was actually the point that Sri Prabhupada is making that this you know and and it's actually interesting that you bring up that question because my boss wasn't necessarily like a spiritualist or anything but in in place of spirituality being the higher principle what she was looking for was that there should be a higher principle there should be some sort of higher principle that is guiding you into this kind of work that is beyond i just want to help people and feel good about it right because if it is i just want to help people and feel good about it then it's a very short fuse right because 
the idea is that at least in social work or in social services, a lot of the times it's not going to feel good. A lot of the times we don't help people the way that we think we can or the way that we we want. Um, a lot of my work in, in the social service world was coming to terms with a broken system, was seeing how awful things are, seeing how this material world is really just like messed up, you know. Um, and after after my social work stint is when I moved into the ashram because <laughs> I was like, I can't do this anymore. But her her idea was that there should be a higher principle guiding because that higher principle is going to carry you through the, the moments where it's not so pretty, right? Where it doesn't look so nice on paper. And, um, and so a material higher principle in our understanding of, 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 of spirituality would be something like ideology, right? It would be something like, I don't know, like socialism or like, I, I'm not sure exactly like what her higher principle is, or was, but something like that, if that makes sense. Like there should be this higher understanding of like, we're doing this for a bigger, greater system. And it's less about like me as an individual doing something to receive a happy feeling in return. Thank you so much. For this. That helps. Often we think oh, if we keep the luck, then only we are selfless, but we, it's a very nice example how people are thinking beyond, you know? So it's, thank you so much. And uh, the other point I would like to appreciate about your uh, finding the middle ground. Even Sanatan Goswami, when he was going for a walk around Govardhan Parikrama, he was asking, how are the crops? And then how is your daughter doing everything? Srila Prabhupada himself was writing prescriptions for his disciples when Guru Puja was going on. So, mm. so thank you for bringing out this part. Thank you so much, Krishna Daya Prabhu, for that beautiful example. Yeah, it's, it's really important. It's really important. And Srila Prabhupada always gives the example actually you know all the answers are there which is which is wonderful and andrea is writing in the chat which i appreciate andrea this helps me see a different perspective on why i burned out as an nyc public school teacher yes <laughs> uh, my mother is an nyc public school teacher and she is burnt out <laughs> she's one year away from retiring but she is burnt out for sure and um yeah Anyone else, final moments, any questions or comments or anything they'd like to share? Andrea, do you want to share about your public school teacher experience? <laughs> I don't want to uh, traumatize everybody with it, but I, I, but in, in all honesty, uh, I think that I'm seeing how selfish my desire was in a way of going into teaching at the time. Obviously I was very, very young. I was in my early twenties and I had not taken care of myself and my own spiritual growth enough to be going into uh, teaching as a service. It wasn't something that was, that I understood it that way. And I don't know that other people around me saw it that way either. I saw a lot of the teachers, it was just a job that they would be able to do. And eventually if they retired, they were gonna get good pension. And you just had to kind of get through it to get to that goal. And there, I don't think that I had, as you said, that superior guidance of maybe a mentor that could have uh, shown me that teaching was a higher purpose and that had that kind of spiritual service. I was going more into it of like, I had very positive experience with teachers and I wanted to give the kids like a positive, happy environment. And then I got into the school and as you said it was there was a lot of things broken that you know I had no support and um and I just didn't have enough of maybe if I had had Krishna at that time since he's full of you know I would have had enough hope for myself and the kids I would have had enough love for myself and the kids and and I didn't and and really making me realize that I no, I didn't have that, but I'm glad that I have it now. And I can do it with the Krishna kids. Hard ball. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Andrea. And I'll just make one final point because I was inspired by what you were saying is that this happens in our material practices. I'm going to put that in air quotes, as well as our spiritual practices where where I can be doing and, and you know, Krishna Daya Prabhu was bringing up this very passion. I can be doing and doing and doing. And even in our, in our services and our seva, I can be doing so much seva and showing up and like this and et cetera and blah, blah, blah. But it can eventually lead to that, that burnout. 
if my if I'm not taking care of myself. And therefore, therefore, the point I wanted to make is that selfishness or selflessness, you know, in our minds, sometimes we 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 prescribe morality to it. It's good, it's bad. This is good and this is bad. And therefore I should do this and not like this. But actually sometimes it's okay to actually sometimes it's okay to say, you know what? I'm not going to do that service because I'm going to focus on my bhajan, you know, and I'm going to be at home and I'm going to read about Krishna and I'm going to nourish myself or I'm going to go to this class instead of like this and like this and like this. So it does need to be a, a subtle balance between the amount that I'm giving and how I'm nourishing or that nourishment being how I'm reminding myself of the higher principle. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you, Kishore Chandra, for a great class. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Okay, Darshan time. Turn your cameras on, please, if you can. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so dumb. Uh, it's after glow time. Now is the time to share. I was calling out Amrita Kishori, but Krishna saved her by muting my microphone. <laughs> so who, who should I call out? Bhima Prabhu? Bhima Prabhu? Can I call you out? Would you like to speak? As long as he keeps both hands on the wheel. <laughs> Keep your knees on the wheel. Bhima Prabhu. All right. <laughs> All right. Adi Purusha Prabhu. Did you see me swerving? You were doing something. I wasn't sure what it was. I thought you were I cursing. Was... Yeah. <laughs> I can't hear you, Bhima Prabhu. You're breaking up. You have to slow down the car. All right. So, okay, okay, Bhima Prabhu is frozen. Who wants to go? Madhi Purusha Prabhu? I just wanted, I have to log yeah, off, but I just wanted to give my appreciation uh, for Kishore Chandra Das Prabhu's uh, class that always has a strong philosophical bent, but you always bring in the practical kind of middle ground, which is why I had that question for you, because it's you're always able to kind of bring it to that. And I really appreciate it. And thank you for kind of forcing me to kind of see my own past in a different way. Uh, I really appreciate that. So as, as your good example of the association of the devotees, not, not to replace therapy, but can be very healing and kind of giving you that different perspective and a way to, to heal in a way from the past. So thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Sure, Chandra Das is an expert, Bhakti expert, healer. <laughs> Okay, who wants to go? Who wants to go? Adi, unmute yourself.
All right, we lost him. Beam up, Prabhu. We lost Beam up, Prabhu. See? I'm sorry, Prabhu. I, yes, Adibo. Hare Krishna. <laughs> I, I cannot. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear yeah. you. Uh, well, I don't have much to say because I missed most of the class. I went over <laughs> the other side of the ma. <laughs> I went over the other side of the mountain and the neck and I couldn't get you guy couldn't get Prabhu speaking. I was like, Oh my God, it, this is great. He's giving such wonderful examples. I was literally, I'm not lying out in the middle of a frozen pond, holding my phone up over my head and the birds were flying over saying, who is this fool? <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, I will watch it later. Um, I, I just wanted to say that in regards to this place, this world that we have come to in order to fulfill our selfish desires. I mean, after all, Krishna has allowed us onto this game board um, that in this game of life, I actually dug it up from my, uh, from my closet, the, uh, the attic the other day. I, had, I don't know how many remember the Milton Bradley game of life. It was a board game. Uh, but anyways, I just, you know, the, as you get older, uh, you start to realize that everything that the material world has to offer is simply a bill of goods. You're being sold a bill of goods, meaning, you know, uh, in Andrea's uh, example, you know, I wanted to become a teacher because of this, or I wanted to become a, an en a lawyer because of this, or I wanted to earn so much money because of this. We could even say, I wanted to earn so much money because I wanted to give so much money to the temple because of this. And what happens is, is that we always, Krishna will always arrange that we are uh, just given the, the, the list of things that we thought were going to happen, but we never get what we really want, because obviously, as we all know, what we really want is Krishna. And that's it. It's Krishna. And there's nothing else. And so everything's a bill of goods. Uh, that's all I have to say. That's what I had at the beginning of the class. I said, we've been tricked. He's tricked us. <laughs> so now it's time to uh, play another game altogether. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Bhima Prabhu. I just, just wanted to appreciate Kishore Chandra Prabhu's point about how we should be guided by a higher principle. I really like that point, the emphasis that Kishore Chandra Prabhu gave. In bhakti, we may feel that we're burning out, we're about to get burnt out, but then we bring this higher principle back on the table and remind ourselves that we're doing this to please Krishna. We're doing this to please Srila Prabhupada. We're not doing this for this particular manager or that particular person. We're doing it to please Krishna, to please Srila Prabhupada, to please our Guru Maharaj through developing nice, good working relationship with the devotees that we're serving together with. So this is the higher principle I was thinking about when Kishore Chandra Prabhu spoke. So thank you very much, Prabhu, for bringing that up. Okay, we can take one more if there is any volunteer. Hmm. All right. That's it, dear devotees. Kishore Chandra Prabhu Ki Jai, Shimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Shishirad Lamuridar Shigur Chandra Ki Jai. Thank you very much. Come back again tomorrow. Shimad Bhagavatam never ends. Hare Krishna. Love you all. Hari Hari Bo. Thank you, Kishore Chandra. Hare Krishna.